G'day. In this clip, I'm going to explain about test flying for the autodidactic aeroplane designer. Because when you take one person's idea of a good aeroplane that somebody else has almost finished building, and you pull it to pieces and redesign it and complete it along your own ideas of what's a good way to build an aeroplane, who else knows more about it? Who should sit in it and find out if it's going to fly? So, I can't tell you how you can develop the qualification, but this is how I came to think that I was up to the job. In the beginning, select your ancestors with care. Pick your DNA. This is my grandfather in 1917 at Billy Stutt School of Aviation at Richmond in New South Wales, learning to fly a Curtis Jenny. He became a lieutenant in the Australian Flying Corps, spent time at the number two school of military aeronautics at Oxford, billeted at the university. Whereas on the other side, this is my father's father's brother, who only learnt to fly once in England. After successful soldiering at Gallipoli and on the French German trench warfare. He actually flew SOP with camels with number four squadron, Australian Flying Corps, and he shot down one German LVG two seater. This causes one to grow up an aero modeler from an early age. Sailing boats are the largest aerofoil a teenager is allowed to play with in a public place because you can't sit in a control line model or a free flight SOP with camel painted in Australian colours. So when you write to the millionaire who owns the local antique airfield with flying vintage aeroplanes, he gives you a job scraping the paint off a tiger moth. And a reference. And as well as learning to start the engine on a SOP with pup replica, he gives you 25 minutes of dual instruction in a Piper Cub, 10 minutes dual in a Hornet Moth. So when you take to the runway in an 8 horsepower Skycraft Scout, it'll take you for a solo and you won't break it and you can take it home intact after 500 miles up the road, tied to the roof of a Morris 1100. Then, after working for six months as a mechanics assistant in a little country town, go down to the capital city, go to the General Aviation Airport there, and get a job as an aircraft detailer for a second-hand aircraft company, which had the agency in Australia for both pit specials and Belenka aerobatic monoplanes. While you're there, stretch the job from detailing second-hand aeroplanes like the Lake Buccaneer that Prince Leonard of Hutt River Province used in his three-day war with Australia when he defeated the Australian government in 1976, all the way up to taking Cessna 152 aerobats out of a container and putting the wings on them to stick them on the Australian register because the boss was undercutting the Australian agent. Eventually, you decide that you've had enough of that and go over to ANSET General Aviation and be taken onto an assembly crew to lawfully assemble Piper General Aviation aircraft and aerospatial helicopters. By luck, in the Royal Aero Club bar, you run into Captain Rosemary Arnold Harris of Helicopter Promotions, and you spend the next four months selling helicopter joyride tickets and flying as aircrew, navigator, and general dog's body in an Enstrom F-28C which spent its time when not in use, parked on an island in the duck pond at El Caballo Blanco, the dancing Spanish horse stables at Norellan on Sydney's outskirts. One even collected a pink business card before finishing up in January 1980. At which point in time, the dashing young aviator was photographed by a girlfriend who wanted to see what he looked like with all the flying gear on. Oh dear. We then have a career change to student nurse at Tamworth Base Hospital where synchronicity kicked in and one was able to acquire two hours and four landings and have some aerobatics instruction in a Pitts S2A. Not this one, it was VHFFF. This one's Whiskey Echo Bravo. 
By the end of the year, nursing training had recommenced again at Repatriation General Hospital Concord. And nursing pays well enough that you can actually afford to go and learn to fly properly in a sailplane for your first year holidays. At Narromine Soaring Centre in October 1981 where you learn that you have to land first time every time. And the blurring in this photograph is due to the vibration caused by the dive brakes that I was using in a Blanick L13 with an instructor called Leslie Murray who sent me solo after 5 hours and 13 minutes over 4 days of gliding instruction. Over the next week another 10 hours were racked up. The last flight was 2 hours and 14 minute solo soaring flight in a Czechoslovakian IS-28 sailplane with a rather different cockpit to that of the Blanick. So one actually has an internationally recognised gliding certificate valid from the 4th of November 1981. In six languages the civil, naval, military authorities including the police are respectfully requested to aid and assist the holder of this certificate. Exactly the same as my grandfather's flying licence. 1981, student nurse, international glider pilot. So, when I turned this into this, I was pretty sure I knew what I was up for. The only problem is I hadn't actually flown anything for 10 years. But, I'd flown very much worse ultralight, and I'm licensed to fly gliders. So once I get the thing up in the sky, I know what to do, even if the engine does fail. So I began by making a very bad mistake. In 1978, to gain confidence, I taxied the Scout for an entire quart of petrol without the wings fitted, just to learn how the fuselage handled. And it had a wide enough undercarriage that there was no drama. It just looked silly, getting around the airport with no wings. So on the 18th of December 1991, the second taxi test ended without the wings. Downhill, downwind on those narrow little wheels, and it fell over, ground looped, broke the propeller. Which was a bit upsetting, but I didn't think of it as a total tragedy because I never really liked this thing. Designed by a computer, and the entire blade is pitched for what is aerodynamically correct for this section of the blade here. It's not a helical propeller. The blade tip is just an aerodynamic fence and the inner blade is a streamlined strut. In contrast to the propeller that I carved for it, which is perfectly helically twisted all the way in to here, very close to the hub. And I took from the 18th of January, below that the 18th of December, to the 14th of February before I had the new prop on and was ready to go and try again. When I got it five feet off the ground. On the 7th of March, I got the thing 100 feet up and I nearly had to fly all the way around the world at that height to get back to the airstrip. All the previous flying had been done pretty much in ground effect and it had been done without the gap cover closing the junction between the two centre sections around the fuselage tube and what happened was that I got it a hundred feet up out over the next paddock and it refused to climb I'd flown out of ground effect and I lost 25 feet of height turning right and I lost another 25 feet of height turning right again and I knew I wasn't going to get over the trees and I just barely managed to turn another right hand turn and come in and land on the cross strip otherwise known as the taxiway after which I got busy and finished building the aeroplane and installing the gap cover that's actually how marginal the performance was fly it without a gap cover and it won't go above 100 feet 
On the 19th of March, 1992, I took it up to 3,200 feet above terrain. And that's when I really gave it its test flying and wrung it all out. Took it up to 60 or 70 miles per hour, stalled it a few times, basically relying on the ballistic recovery parachute to get me back to the ground if the wings fell off. That's what it's there for. That's why I put it there. But I never needed it. The wings didn't fall off. It handled quite well in the sky. On the 25th of March 1992, I flew it in over my mother's house at Glen Innes. And my son looked up and saw Daddy in his aeroplane. We also did the air-to-air -air photography that day. Sadly, the bloke using my camera didn't know how to focus it, so anything closer than this was a write-off. But he did get some pretty nice shots. Grounder air. This is on takeoff. Looking for a bit of lift over the ridge. And here it goes, sailing past the hangar. My second aeroplane. VJ24W Sunfun Budgerigar. Ultimate development of the world's first ultralight motor glider. Yahoo Yippee! On the 26th and the 28th, I flew from Glen Lee to Red Range and did donuts in the sky over the family home. Second flight on the 28th, went out to Glen Cove, outlanded at Ben Lomond. So I told a lie. The outlanding at Van Lomond was on the 26th of the 4th, and that was the first flight with a new propeller, which I'd made by making a reverse copy of a JPX pusher propeller, which Frank used to use when he was into trikes. Second of the 5th, 92, we flew up to Van Lomond, and after outlanding at Van Lomond on the 2nd of the 5th, we flew to Red Range, where I had a great deal of trouble fitting it into the small 200-yard paddock, where I did the full and complete Biggles impersonation, land in the paddock across the road from the house, wearing leather jacket, flying helmet, white silk scarf, fur-lined boots, the complete rig, because that is how I used to like to fly. What's the point? in teaching yourself to design and build and test fly if you can't look like Biggles, eh? I mean, what is the point of it? Here's what it says. Upwind wires, downwind takeoff, hit fence, six inches below top, flipped, gross structural damage, broke right ankle. Which was not quite what Biggles had in mind, eh? So this is where the world's ultimate development of the world's first ultralight motor glider lives these days where I use its trailer for storage space. When it landed upside down in the potato patch, the impact broke the back of the aeroplane. And I'd never got around to putting a lap sash, or putting shoulder straps onto the lap sash. So that bend in the bulkhead was made by my forehead these are the rudder bar where my foot was when the fence post came into the front of the cockpit. And here's the instrument panel, which I used to be so proud of. And this is the dent in the front of the fuselage pod that the fence post made when it came in. The impact destroyed Utterly, the second propeller that I'd built for the Jensen. Of course, it was entirely my own fault. I should never have tried to take off downwind. Even though it was terrifying to the spectators because taking off upwind would have meant going over the fence and while I was crossing the road, deciding whether I was going to go over the power lines or under the power lines. The fact is I'd done three touch and goes into that paddock while trying to stop the thing and fit it in in the first place. I knew that if I had enough wind I could get out by going the right way. I chose to listen to advice, I took off downwind, I crashed, I broke the aeroplane, I haven't fixed it yet. Probably I won't. <laughs>